Quiet in the chambers. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please remove all hats. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Please be seated. Roll call. Arroyo. Here. Barron. Present. Cabrera. Here. Chin. Here. Cohen. Here. Constantinides. Here. Cornegie. Presente. Crowley. Cumbo. Deutsch. Yes. Dickens. Drum. Here. Espinal. Here. Ferreras Copeland. Gorodnik. Here. Gentili. Here. Gibson. Greenfield. Here. Johnson. Here. Kalos. King. Ku. President. Kozlowitz. Here. Lanceman. Here. Lander. Levin. Here. Levine. Here. Mizell. Matteo. Mealy, Menchaca, Mendez, Miller, Menchaca, Palma, Reynoso, Richards, Rodriguez, Rose. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Torres. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Mizell. Here. Vaca. Vallone. Weprin. Williams. Here. Wills. Here. Gibson. Here. Matteo. Lander. Eugene. Here. Lander. Here. Ignizio. Van Bramer. Here. Speaker Mark Viverito. All quiet in the chambers, please rise for the invocation delivered by Abbot Bahante Codonia, Staten Island Buddhist Fahara at 1115 John Street in Staten Island, New York. Quiet in the chambers. Good afternoon. Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samdas. Honored the Blessed One, the Exalted One, the Fully Enlightened One. I quote. Peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, 
short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upward to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbound, freed from hatred and ill will. May everyone in this city council as be well, happy, peaceful, and secure. May all those who are working hard to improve quality of life of everyone in this great city, in this nation, be well, happy, and peaceful, and secure. May all beings, including all those experience terrible effect of earthquake and who are still suffering in Nepal, be well, happy, peaceful, and secure. May we all and all beings be free from suffering, be free from fear, be free from grief. May we all and all beings attain peace and happiness. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, several weeks ago, terrible earthquake took place in Nepal where many Buddhists live. 8,000 plus people died out of those 200 some were monks and nuns. Many became homeless, so we Buddhists are grateful to, for support received from many people from various countries, including the USA. Earthquakes, floods, fire, hurricanes are familiar things in the world. They come and go. Can we stop them? No. We cannot do anything against nature. We have to understand the nature. Nature phenomena are so powerful. We cannot be disrespectful to the nature. If we become too greedy, we cause harm to them, nature. Nature will harm us. Therefore, we have to be mindful what we do. Let's not do anything harmful to any being all beings happy and secure. Bhavatu sabbha mangalam rakhantu sabbha devata sabbha buddha anubhavene sabbha dhamma anubhavene sabbha sangha anubhavene sada sati bhavantu te Thank you. Please be seated. Council Member Debbie Rose. Colleagues, it is an honor for me to motion to spread the invocation in full upon the record. Today, I am grateful for the words of wisdom and inspiration that we have heard by, from Abbot Bhante Kanda, Kandaya. He is the head monk at the Staten Island Buddhist Vihara. <clears throat> He completed his monastic training in Sri Lanka and holds a BA in Buddhist philosophy from the University of Kelanye, Sri Lanka. In 1985, he came to the United States to provide his skills and services at the New York Buddhist Vihara and has also completed a BS in social work at CUNY. In 1997, he obtained his MSW from Fordham University. I don't know if my colleagues know, but Staten Island has the largest Sri Lankan um, population outside of Sri Lanka. And um, Abbot Kandanya has been an integral part of New York's extremely diverse and close-knit Buddhist community. As former president of the Buddhist Council of New York, he worked to enhance the spiritual foundation of all New Yorkers. He's been very inclusive and he's been an in integral part of supporting Staten Island's growing Sri Lankan community, and especially after 2004, the tsunami in Thailand. 
and unfortunately, he is currently working diligently with community groups to help provide relief for post-earthquake Nepal. It is indeed an honor. Thank you. Adoption of minutes, Council Member Drum. Thank you. I make a motion that the minutes of the stated meeting of April 28, 2015 be adopted as printed. Thank you. Messages and papers from the mayor. None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. M293, Banking Commission. Finance. Petitions and communications, preconsidered M294, Stanley Richards, candidate for appointment. Rules, privileges, and elections. Preconsidered M295, Patricia Machir, candidate for recommendation. Rules, privileges, and elections. Land use call up. None. Quiet in the chambers, please. And now we'll hear from the speaker, Melissa Mark Riverito. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate, and good afternoon to my colleagues. Buenas tardes a mis colegas. Today, the Council will be voting on a package of three bills that will improve pedestrian, cyclists, and motorist safety on trucking routes and ensure that large privately owned and city operated garbage trucks are equipped with safety devices that can prevent fatalities and collisions. The first bill requires a study by the Department of Transportation on truck route compliance. The city restricts the use of large trucks to certain streets, but each year thousands of trucks are cited for illegally straying from these designated routes. This has raised safety and traffic concerns, especially in highly residential areas. DOT study will look at locations where truckers are often cited for operating off designated routes, as well as locations identified by council members and community boards as having a history of problems. The second bill we'll vote on today requires the department to study the safety of pedestrians and cyclists along truck routes. The department will be required to look into the impact of tolling policy on truck route usage, serious collisions that have occurred in the past five years, and review their own strategies and make recommendations for increasing pedestrian and cyclist safety. Um, these two bills, sponsored by Council Members Vallone and Chin, respectively, if they could each say a few words on the bills. Council Member Vallone. All right, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as the Speaker said, and with Chair Rodriguez of the- I'm sorry, if I could, I, I, I'd ask my colleagues, we have a very long agenda today. There's a lot that we want to get done. There's going to be a lot of speaking to these issues, and the longer that we have to keep shushing people, the longer we're going to be here. So if we could, people could please uh, uh, try to restrain from that. Thank you. Refrain from that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and also thank you to our Madam Advocate for marching in all the parades this weekend, especially out in district. And happy birthday, Margaret Chin. I know it's nice to turn 19 again. So on this bill, many of us, if not all of us, have been plagued by commercial trucks on residential streets. And this is a pure quality of life issue that we are so frustrated with when the DOT and the NYPD look at each other and say there's nothing we can do. So what we have here is a bill that we are looking for everyone's vote on today to say enough is enough and require a study, but beyond a study, to put requiring safety measures to be put in place. And that's the most important part for all of us, so we have some teeth to this, to be brought in by community board, civic leaders, and our offices. So we're involving our entire district in this process, so everyone's happy to target the most abused residential streets that are, are frequent and too often by our commercial trucks. So this is going to be finally looked at, dealt with, and changed. So a big thank you to Chair Rodriguez, Kelly Taylor for transportation, Laura Popo, Lyle Frank, my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Schott, and my Policy and Legislative Director, Ahmed Nazar. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for allowing us to come forward today. Council Member Chin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking my co-prime sponsor on Intro 641A, Council Member Idanas Rodriguez and Jimmy Van Bramer. i also like to thank especially our uh, Chair Councilmember Rodriguez for his leadership as Transportation Committee Chair for all his hard work to advance critical Vision Zero legislation. I believe this comprehensive study of pedestrian and cyclist safety along truck routes will become a powerful new tool in our city's Vision Zero effort. There are more than 1,000 miles of truck routes in our city, and we already know that while trucks makes up less than 4% of all the vehicles on our street. They account for collisions that cause more than 30% of cyclist fatalities and more than 10% of pedestrian fatalities. The last time DOT conducted and released a study specifically regarding truck routes was around eight years ago. 
And we know that it's time to take another look, an even more comprehensive look, at safety along these routes. This new study, required to be released by DOT no later than June 30, 2016, will also review the impact of our tolling policy on the use of truck routes and their overall effect on street safety. Perhaps most importantly, DOT will also be required to use all of the information from this study to recommend new policies to improve pedestrian and cyclist safety along truck routes. In terms of our tolling policy and truck route designation, I believe these new strategies will help us make the kinds of smart fixes and broad reform that will help us prevent future crashes and save lives. I also want to thank my Chief of Staff, Yume Katase, for her work on this legislation, as well as Kelly Taylor and the Transportation Committee staff, and I ask my colleague to vote in favor. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, colleagues. The final bill in this package would require all large trucks used by city agencies and private waste hauling vehicles to be equipped with side guards. Side guards are devices that fit onto the side of trucks, preventing pedestrians and cyclists from falling into the exposed space between a vehicle's axles. While side guards have been underutilized in most American cities, they are required in Japan and many European countries. And after the United Kingdom mandated side guard use, fatalities for cyclists in collisions with trucks dropped over 60%. Last year when we passed the Vision Zero legislative package, we made it clear that we were only taking the first step in an ongoing process to make streets safer for all New Yorkers. Today we're taking another step forward with these bills. Trucks are an integral part of our economy and their drivers are critical partners in making Vision Zero successful. These bills take a comprehensive approach to making this sector even safer by improving not just our citywide planning and policy, but the vehicles themselves. On all of our legislative matters, I first want to thank Magga Wald and Laura Popa. On these bills in particular, Aisha Schomburg, Joan Pavolny, Jan Atwell, Terza, Nasser, Lyle, uh, Frank, and Matt Gawalb. And with that, I'll ask Council Member Idani Swabigas to say a few words. Thank you, Speaker, for the great leadership that you have shown not only on bills related, related to Vision Zero, but on many issues affecting transportation. Uh, today, uh, with those three bills, the community transportation is, is hitting the, our 22 bills that we have passed, 17 of them related to Vision Zero. Uh, this particular bill, uh, uh, I had the opportunity to have my colleague, Council Member Johnson, as the co-sponsor of this bill. And again, like, I think that on all those three bills that we are passing on transportation, the message that we are sending in the city is that we need to be there for our pedestrians and for our cyclists. The, the side guard bills is a bill that we reduce that will improve the safety for our uh, pedestrians and cyclists to more than 50% when someone is hit by, by the truck. Uh, the other two bills will allow us to, to bring the data, the information that we provide us a better understanding on how trucks are moving our streets and therefore to be able to use those information to work on legislation and initiatives that make transportation in our streets safer and more efficient. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Council Member. And I want to also um, uh, commend Corey Johnson for leadership on this bill as well. Um, and he'll be speaking about another bill that he's sponsoring today. Um, we are going to be voting on legislation that brings transparency to the health services being provided in city jails. Uh, the bill that we will be voting on today requires the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to provide quarterly reports that include all physical or mental health data provided to them by any health care provider currently proving, I'm sorry, providing services in any city jail. If the health care provider in question does not provide data, the department will still be required to issue quarterly reports on patient safety, preventable hospitalization, and preventable medical care errors. The council has been at the forefront of our city's ongoing discussion about incarceration rates and deplorable conditions in city jails. This bill will help the city with our ongoing efforts to reform our jails and end inhumane treatment of inmates. I uh, want to invite council member Corey Johnson, who sponsored both the side guard legislation and this transparency bill to say a few words. On the staff side, I would just like to thank David Seitzer, Crystal Pond, Terza Nasser, uh, and Magda Walb. And with that, Council Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon. Today, the Council is addressing an urgent issue. 
the health care that is provided to our cities incarcerated. The people coming into our city's jails are overwhelmingly poor and are overwhelmingly sick, and they are desperately in need of quality health services. Inmates enter this system with high rates of HIV, hepatitis C, asthma, hypertension, and substance abuse, all at rates significantly higher than the general population. It is of utmost importance that we address these issues competently and comprehensively. The allegations that have mounted over the years, and as we've seen recently in the news, suggest that the city's contractor, Corizon, is failing to provide comprehensive and safe services to people under their care. These reports suggest that treatment provided to inmates may have been a factor in at least 15 deaths over the last five years, and that these deaths may have been preventable. In all of these cases, quality or timeliness of health care was an issue. The first step in addressing these problems is getting a better picture of the adequacy of the services being provided. Introduction number 440A would improve transparency by identifying the metrics by which we should evaluate this system. We need to hold Corizon and the city agencies that oversee them responsible for performance in key areas like wait times, sick times, access to medication, follow-up visits, and preventable hospitalizations. This reporting lays the groundwork for a broader conversation about accountability. With this legislation, quarterly reports would be required from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that would give us insight on the medical services provided in jails such as Rikers Island. This bill would ultimately decrease the preventable death of inmates, increase patient safety, and reduce the risk of errors in our jail's medical systems. And today I ask for your support in ensuring the continued protection and wellness of inmates across New York. I want to thank Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Commissioner Dr. Mary Bassett for her work on this issue and that her department has done on this. I also want to thank my legislative director, Lewis Children Brown, uh, the former committee counsel, Dan Hafitz, who's no longer with us, our current committee counsel, David Seitzer, who's been amazing, Crystal Pond, the policy analyst, Krillian Francisco, the finance analyst, and Tirza Nasser for preparing this legislation today. And Madam Speaker, I just quickly want to say a word about side guards. Side guards save lives. They save lives. This has been done in Boston, in the UK, in Japan, and all over Europe, and we are going to require that every truck sanitation that the city owns or private haulers be required to have side guards so that lives are saved. We know it works. We know it will happen. And I want to thank Kelly Taylor and Tirza Nasser and Lewis Children Brown for their work on this. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Uh, additionally, we have a bill requiring the Department of Education to provide an annual report regarding student demographics and the Department's efforts to encourage diversity within schools, such as strategic site selection of new schools and special programs, and considering the demographics of neighborhoods when drawing attendance zones. The bill will also require the Department of Education to report certain information pertaining to the admissions criteria for each school. This bill will allow the Council and the public to see demographic data in addition to race and ethnicity regarding students who receive special education services, are English language learners, receive free or reduced price lunch, reside in temporary housing, or are attending school outside of their community. While well, New York City schools overall are diverse, there have been concerns raised that individual schools and districts are not diverse. Diverse schools have been shown to benefit all students. This bill will allow us to better understand the issue and find the best ways to encourage greater diversity. On the staff side, I want to thank Aisha Schomburg, Joan, uh, Joan Pavalny, Jan Atwell, Terza Nasser, Lyle Frank, and Michael Walb. And I'd like to ask Councilmember Brad Lander, the lead sponsor, to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your support. I want to ask my colleagues to support the School Diversity Accountability Act, which is both Intro 511A, requiring an annual report on diversity or, unfortunately, the lack thereof in New York City schools, with extensive school-by-school -school data down to the grade level, as well as the department's specific efforts and initiatives to strengthen diversity, and it's packaged with Resolution 453, introduced by Councilmember Torres, calling on New York City Department of Education to establish diversity as a priority in admissions, zoning, and other decision-making. As we learned in a 10-hour hearing uh, chaired by Councilmember Drum in December, thank you, Councilmember, uh, New York City's remarkable diversity is one of our greatest strengths, but we are failing woefully to bring that diversity into our schools. 
60 years after the Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal is inherently unequal in Brown versus Board, it is shameful to have a school system that is among the most segregated in the country. Unfortunately, last year, the US UCLA Civil Rights Project released New York's extreme school segregation, inequality in action, and a damaged future, which found that our schools are amongst the most segregated in the country. A few quick stats. In more than half of our city's 1,600 public schools, black and Latino students make up 90% or more of the student population. Meanwhile, half of the city's white students are concentrated in just 7% of our schools, and half of the city's Asian students are concentrated in just 6% of the schools. There's deep segregation by income as well as by race, and unfortunately, even as residential segregation has gotten modestly better, school segregation has not. Intro 511 will require the Department of Education to submit an annual report to the City Council and post on its website. Uh, the first one will be due at the end of this year, covering K-12, to and then we'll give them one more year to get the pre-K data up uh, and include pre-K as well. Grade level, race or ethnicity, gender for students who are English language learners, their primary home language, as well as breaking out the categories the, speech the speaker mentioned, such as special ed service, free and reduced lunch, um, and some report, uh, data related to test performance and test levels as well. The law will also require DOE for the first time to report on the admissions processes used by each school or special program, uh, and require DOE to report on any efforts during the preceding school year to encourage a diverse student body in schools and special programs, which will help advocates who are pioneering uh, good strategies in some of our schools and districts, and I want to call out the leadership of Districts 1, 3, 13, and 15, and of Appleseed, New York, who have been pioneering different school-based and district-based uh, district strategies, like controlled choice, like non-zoned elementary schools, like educational option high schools, that really are making a difference and can do more if we track and hold ourselves accountable. Um, I also want to thank Asia Schomburg, Jan Atwell, Jan Palavny, Lyle Frank, Tirza Nasser, and Matt Gawalb, um, as well as my legislative director, Ben Smith, and from the administration, Reggie Thomas. Uh, thanks very much to all thank of you for your support. Thank you, Council Member. Today we're also voting to approve a rezoning on Vanderbilt Avenue. Thanks to the leadership of Council Member Dan Gorodnik, this new, and we're fully aware of the banging upstairs. We're trying to take care of that. It's pretty annoying. Uh, today we're also voting to approve a rezoning on Vanderbilt Avenue. Thanks to the leadership of Council Member Dan Gorodnik, this new agreement secures a $220 million investment from SL Green to make needed public transit and public space improvements in and around Grand Central Station. Uh, this allows us to upgrade and improve public transit with an infusion of money that doesn't cost the taxpayer a dime. Uh, this has been a lot of work into this, uh, Council Member Gorodnik. It's a proud day. Uh, and he'll say a few words and then followed by a chair of our land use, Council Member Greenfield. Council Member Gorodnik. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and for the chance to speak uh, about the Vanderbilt Carter rezoning and the special permit application for one Vanderbilt. As you all may recall, toward the end of his administration, former Mayor Bloomberg proposed an extensive rezoning of East Midtown. While I shared his concerns about the quality and age of office buildings in the area, the mayor's proposal left too many unresolved questions of air rights pricing, public realm improvements, and infrastructure deliverables. This was particularly troubling in the context of so much as-of-right zoning. As a result, I ultimately decided to oppose that plan and Mayor Bloomberg withdrew it. Last year, with my support, Mayor de Blasio and City Planning Commission Chair Weisbrod announced a different two-pronged approach to the zoning challenges of East Midtown. The first prong, the first phase before us today is a rezoning of Vanderbilt Avenue between 42nd and 47th Streets in which applicants can apply for a special permit to build up to 30 FAR in exchange for public improvements or via the purchase of air rights from a neighboring landmark. The second phase covering the rest of East Midtown will follow. It is no secret that Grand Central and the Vanderbilt Avenue corridor in particular are in need of significant improvements. Grand Central is a mess. It is one of the busiest transit hubs in the world and it has gotten crowded well beyond its capacity. It badly needs upgrades to its infrastructure and pedestrian circulation system. Sidewalks in the area are far too narrow and crowded. And Vanderbilt Avenue, a street directly adjacent to one of the most iconic buildings in New York City, 
looks and feels like a back alley. This is hardly a local issue for my council district. It affects every one of our constituents no matter where they live. This rezoning will bring some badly needed change to the area. My concerns from last term, which included the fact that so much certainty was afforded to the development community with few guarantees to the public, do not exist here. That's because the city and the public maintain full discretion to approve or deny each application through a special permit. Any applicant along the corridor will have the burden of convincing the public that the proposed infrastructure improvements are worthy of the additional development rights. We, in turn, will demand that any improvements to area infrastructure are done and delivered to the public in advance of the occupancy of the building. The first applicant at 1 Vanderbilt has proposed considerable infrastructure improvements ranging from subway entrances to platform changes to new public areas and access points to Grand Central, initially valued at $210 million in exchange for the density bonuses necessary to build a 1.6 million square foot and 67 story commercial building. In addition to those improvements, the Council has negotiated in this process some additional significant changes to one Vanderbilt to further enhance the benefit to the public. The additional improvements bring SL Green's total public investment to at least $220 million. It is worth noting that these improvements come out to about $400 per square foot of additional density, which means the public is getting far more per square foot than they would have under the Bloomberg plan. Additionally, the public will see these improvements up front. If there are cost overruns or unforeseen circumstances, the developer is still on the hook to complete the project before moving into their building. It will, even with this first project alone, create over 5,000 construction jobs, 190 permanent union jobs, and create $50 million in annual tax revenues for the city. I want to commend the chair of the multi-board task force, Lola Finkelstein, and the other members of both community boards five and six, borough president Gail Brewer for their thoughts and recommendations throughout this process. I want to recognize and thank Chairs Weppern and Greenfield and the Speaker for their support throughout this process. Today, we have a much better rezoning and project thanks to their support, their work, and their thoughtful suggestions, and I want to urge my colleagues to join me today in voting to approve this first part of the East Midtown rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Greenfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Dan Garonick, and uh, congratulations on really outstanding negotiations on behalf of your constituents. And, and the importance really of what we're doing today, the technically we're modifying the Vanderbilt corridor, uh, text amendment and approving one Vanderbilt, is that in New York City, we're, we're blessed to have a few central business districts, but the central business district in Midtown Manhattan is an iconic central business district that really over the last few years has been losing its competitive edge with the inability to bring up new buildings and to really compete with other global cities. And so what we're doing here today is much more important than simply a rezoning in one neighborhood. It really will have a positive impact on the entire city. And I do want to point out uh, something that Councilmember Gorodnik pointed out, and I want to also recognize uh, Bar President Gail Brewer for her stewardship as well. And that is that if you look at the trend of what's been happening here in the City Council, every major and minor land use deal has been improved as a result of this Council. And that really is to the credit of the Speaker who has empowered the Land Use Committee to really get things done on behalf of individual Council members. So whether you go back to the Domino development where we added extra affordable housing units or Astoria Cove where we upped the percentage of affordability and made sure that there were good union jobs or even right now where we have massive improvements in infrastructure and that really is thanks to the leadership of the council and the really outstanding cooperation that we have with city planning under their chair commissioner Carl Weisbrot who we're very grateful for his work. I just really want to thank the land use staff. They put thousands of hours into this, especially Raju Mann and Ann McCoyhe for the outstanding work that they did. I think we should all be proud of what we're accomplishing today. We took a project that was going to get railroaded through in the old administration, 
We slowed it down. We got community input. It's a better project, more improvements, and we've set a great precedent for the future. I really want to once again congratulate Councilmember Gorodnik for his leadership, and this is really a great project to be proud of, not just for his district, but for the entire city of New York. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Finally, the Council will be voting on a bill that creates a New York City Office of Civil Justice. Mandating the creation of this office was something I promised during my State of the City address in February, and I'm proud to be a co-prime sponsor of the bill with Councilmember Levine. All across our city, there are New Yorkers struggling with the court system who find themselves in desperate need of legal counsel they simply can't afford. These are individuals and families facing threats of eviction, intimidation by debt collectors, and denial of government benefits they are entitled to. They are fighting to protect their homes and their financial security, and sadly, they are often fighting this alone. The research on this matter is conclusive. Limited access to an attorney means limited access to justice. And the people most likely to face these legal battles without a lawyer's help are among the most vulnerable, domestic violence survivors, seniors, and people with disabilities. Allowing this to continue isn't just dysfunctional, it isn't just poor public policy, and it isn't immoral and wrong. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's just, it's just poor public policy, it's immoral and it's wrong. That's why we're voting to mandate the creation of an office dedicated to working to ensure that low-income New Yorkers have access to legal representation. The Office of Civil Justice will be led by a civil justice coordinator, and as I said in my State of the City, this will be the People's Law Firm. The Civil Justice Coordinator will help city agencies collaborate with nonprofits, pro bono programs, and other providers, as well as advise the mayor on implementation of civil legal services and make relevant budget recommendations. The task we've given this new office is simple but essential, to work toward ensuring adequate legal representation for all low-income New Yorkers. On the staff side, really want to do a special th uh, thank you to Rob Calandra, Matt Gawab, Josh Hanshaft, and Ed Atkin and ask uh, Councilmember Mark Levine to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for being so passionate and determined on this issue. Uh, I also want to thank Chair Lanceman for moving this to his committee so expeditiously. And I want to thank my colleague, Vanessa Gibson, who's been an incredible champion on civil justice, uh, especially in the housing court arena. I'm just so proud of the City Council, which is focused like a laser on the injustice that is occurring in civil courts in New York City, where tens of thousands of New Yorkers every year are facing eviction without an attorney, they're facing deportation without an attorney, foreclosure of their home without an attorney. And we have stepped up to the plate to do something about this, to address the terrible human toll that this injustice has taken. We have more than doubled the funding going to civil justice representation in the last budget, and I think we'll be more than doubling it again, a huge achievement that will ease our homeless crisis and ease our affordable housing crisis. And today we're taking another big step forward with a critical piece of the infrastructure by creating for the first time an office of civil justice in the city that will coordinate and consolidate all the civil justice programs that we're currently supporting, that will monitor all the contracts we have with our wonderful providers who are doing this work in the courts every day, that will report back to this body every year with updates on the scope and impact of civil justice representation and an analysis of the upmet need and which will critically prepare a five-year plan on how this city can get to full representation in housing court and other arenas. Truly, truly uh, important legislation that I'm proud to have uh, co-sponsored with the speaker. I want to thank the staff who worked so hard to make this possible over a period of months, including Laura Popa, Rob Newman, Matt Gawalb, Josh Hanshaft, Rob Kalendra, Amy Slattery, and my fabulous chief of staff, Aya Keefe, who labored tirelessly and brilliantly to make this possible. And I want to thank the incredible coalition of community groups that's come together to make this possible, some of whom are here with us today including CASA, Bronx Defenders, Community Board 12 in Manhattan, and so many others. Thank you all, and thank you again, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Council Member, for your support on this issue. Um, finally, I, I wanted to just say a couple of, uh, I guess it was Council Member Margaret Chin's birthday yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, so happy birthday, Margaret. Um, and also, uh, our good friend and former colleague, Lou Fiddler, is celebrating his birthday today. 
but we were also really happy to learn that he's also ce celebrating a successful kidney transplant. You know, we were waiting. He was waiting for a while, so it's great to hear that he uh, is in good spirits and, and doing well. So obviously wishing him a happy birthday and a complete recovery. And lastly, um, Councilmember Mendez has put a dear colleague letter on, on top of everyone's desk. Uh, if you would really encourage all of my colleagues that can attend and join us tomorrow, uh, the Follow Me Friday that we are doing to support the local businesses that were impacted as a result of the explosion uh, that happened recently, very unfortunate. Uh, having gone through a similar experience in my district, unfortunately, uh, we know the impact that this has not only for residents uh, who may be permanently or temporarily displaced, but also the businesses that suffer uh, revenue and suffer loss of support. So uh, with that, I do hope that colleagues will join us tomorrow. It's going to be a crawl to several businesses. I'm sorry, Friday. Sorry, I'm a little. For Friday, uh, we'll be visiting several locations and anyone else that wants to join, this is about supporting the community. So uh, any of the press that wants to join us, feel free. So with that, um, I conclude remarks. Communication from the speaker. Thank you. Discussion of general orders. Councilmember Vaca for a vote. I ask permission to vote aye on all calendar yes. items. Thank, Thank you. you. Report of special. Councilmember Ferreras. I vote aye. Thank you. Report of special committees. None. Up. Oh. Councilmember Darlene Mealy. I vote aye on all. We, Thank you. Do we vote? Report of special committees. No. None. Reports of Standing Committees. Report of the Committee on Courts and Legal Services, Intro 736A, Office of Civil Justice. Amended and coupled on General Orders. Report of the Committee on Education, Intro 511A, Report on Student Demographics. Amended and coupled on General Orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, Intro 764, Lower East Side Bid. Coupled on General Orders. Report of the Committee on Health, Intro 440A, Health Services in Correctional Facilities. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU-223, Zoning Amendment. Approved the modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Rule 11.70B of the Rules of the Council and Section 197D of the New York City Charter. L excuse me, LU-224 and Reso 712, Maritime Lease. Coupled on general orders. LU-225 and Reso 713 through LU-228 and Reso 716, real property tax exemptions. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections, M-289 and Reso 717, approving the appointment of Karen Redliner, Board of Health. Coupled on general orders. M-290 and Reso 718, approving the appointment of Dr. Ramanathan Raju, Board of Health. Uh, coupled on general orders. M291 and Reso 719, approving the appointment of Rose M. Gill, Board of Health. Coupled on general orders. M292 and Reso 720, yep. approving the appointment of William Aguado, Taxi and Limousine Commission. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered M294 and Reso 721, approving the recommendation of Stanley Richards, Board of Correction. Uh, Stanley is here. Stanley Richards. Um, I want to say I, I am very proud that under this council, this is the first time the city council um, is approving someone who is formerly incarcerated uh, to be on the board of corrections. And I think that that uh, is a really... <laughs> proud accomplishment, um, someone who has dedicated his career, his professional career, uh, to really making and improving the lives of others. Uh, so congratulations, Stanley. I know you've heard it a lot these couple of days, but we're very proud of this moment. Uh, and thank you for your partnership on making sure that we improve the Board of Corrections, I mean, improve the Department of Corrections uh, and, and uh, all the work that lies ahead. Thank you very much. So with that, coupled on general orders. Pre-considered M295 and Reso 722, approving the recommendation of Patricia Machir Youth Board. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Transportation, Intro 198A, Side Guards. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 315A, Truck Route Compliance Study. Uh, amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 641A, Pedestrian and Cyclist Safety Study. Amended and coupled on general orders. 
on the general order calendar, LU 197 and Reso 723 through LU 201 and Reso 727 on page 11, Vanderbilt Avenue corridor. Coupled on general orders. LU 209 and Reso 728 and LU 210 and Reso 729 zoning permits. Coupled on general orders. LU 211 and Reso 730 zoning amendment. Coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, commissioner of deeds. Uh, coupled on general orders, and at this time I ask for full roll call on all items coupled on the general order calendar. Arroyo. Aye. Barron. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I want to give congratulations to Stanley Richards on uh, his nomination. I want to express uh, condolences for the those who've passed but in regards to the bill and the resolution on addressing the diversity or lack thereof in the in the city school systems i'm very pleased that it is up for a vote and that my colleagues bill will be voted on and very disappointed that reso 442 was removed because it too addresses the inequity that exists in our schools in terms of specialized high school, but it was a VESO, and we do know that it is at the state, so we hope that it will see the light of day there and be successful. I vote aye on all. Cabrera. Aye. Chin. Aye on all. Cohen. Aye. Constantinidis. Aye on all. Carnegie. Abora. Crowley. Aye. Combo. Aye. Deutsch. Aye and all. Dickens. Aye. Drum. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Pat, uh, Madam Public Advocate. I also want to thank Speaker Mark Viverito and take this opportunity to highlight the historic nature of today's council vote on Stanley Richards for the Board of Correction. I'm very proud to have raised Stanley's name for consideration. I first met Stanley through his work at the Fortune Society where my friend Robert was receiving services. As someone with more than two decades experience helping to guide one of the country's leading reentry programs and a personal experience of incarceration, Stanley will bring a fresh perspective to the board. The appointment of an individual who has been directly impacted by the Board of Corrections policies is long overdue. For my friend Robert and all of the other individual, individuals yet to pass through the gates of Rikers and our others, other jails, the appointment of Stanley to the board represents a promise of justice that their voices will finally be heard and taken seriously. I believe Stanley shares my views that preparation for reentry into society begins when individuals first enter the criminal justice system. Our jails should be places where individuals can fight their cases and prepare their lives on the outside, all without the threat of violence. This is the only way these individuals can move forward and our society can become safer. I ask that my colleagues seize this moment to effect lasting change in our criminal justice system by voting to approve Stanley Richards. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank Chair Lander, Brad Lander, for his work on this and also Chuck Davis for everything he did to prepare for this appointment. Thank you very much and congratulations to Stanley Richards. Please refrain. Please keep it down, refrain from applause. If you approve, just thank you. Espinal. I vote aye. Eugene. I vote aye. Gorodnik. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to congratulate Councilmember Menchaca on the deal that he reached and led uh, between the council and EDC to approve a master lease at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. This is an area with enormous potential for economic activity and job creation, and its significance extends far beyond Sunset Park. But I am confident that Councilmember Menchaca achieved a deal that will both bring jobs to Sunset Park and will give the community a real voice in future planning in the neighborhood. And I do want to say that it was an absolute pleasure for me to work with Councilmember Menchaca on this project, and I know how lucky his constituents are to have him fighting on their behalf. And I also wanted to thank um, EDC President Kyle Kimball for his collaboration, and we wish him the best of luck in whatever comes next. So, Councilmember Menchaca, congratulations, and I happily vote yes on this and all other items. Gentilly. I vote aye. 
Gibson. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate, and I certainly want to applaud the leadership of our speaker and Council Member Mark Levine. Um, I want to speak in support of Intro 736A to create an Office of Civil Justice understanding that this is a great move, a great step of progress in the coordination of all civil legal services in the city in looking at the efficacy and coordinating uh, recommendations on improvements in our civil legal service industry. Uh, I recognize that this is a very important step and also want to applaud all of the advocates and colleagues for really standing firm on looking at right to counsel in making sure that we can provide legal representation in eviction proceedings. I represent Bronx County, Bronx Housing Court, which has faced thousands of evictions across this city that are very preventable. And so I'm really glad that we're looking at this civil justice coordinator that can really look at civil legal services. I want to thank all of the phenomenal advocacy groups that have really stood with us in the trenches, helped to educate us on ways in which we can improve the lives of so many residents that deserve and need sufficient and quality housing in this city. I want to thank Bronx CASA, Legal Aid, Legal Services, Urban Justice, Housing Court Answers, Tenants Alliance, New York Law Center, and Bronx Defenders for all of their work. And again, thank you, Madam Speaker, for your leadership. You talked about it in February, and here we are voting on it, and I'm very proud of this day. And thank you to our colleague, Council Member Mark Levine, for your leadership. It's a pleasure working with you across the river, Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, United. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I will vote aye on all, and I congratulate all of my colleagues on all the other bills, as well as our nominees. Congratulations to your Board of Corrections and TLC and the Department of Health. Thank you, and I vote aye on all. Greenfield. May I explain my vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, I, too, would like to congratulate uh, my colleagues, especially Councilmember Johnson, who lately just seems like he's passing uh, the lion's share of legislation here in the City Council. Two pieces today. Well done. Councilmember Lander for the great work that he's been doing on a very important issue. Uh, Councilmember Mark Levine and the Speaker for uh, tremendous, tremendous leadership with the uh, creation of this new office. Uh, Councilmembers Vallone and Chin, and uh, as well to congratulate Councilmember Menchaca on a, on a great deal for his constituents and Sunset Park. Some real, uh, terrific, tangible benefits for his constituency. Uh, also, want uh, to want to congratulate Councilmember Deutsch, who uh, uh, negotiated a, a terrific uh, resolution for a controversial project in his district, and Councilmember Arroyo as well. And uh, finally, I want to congratulate Councilmember Gorodnik as well, and also just to recognize that uh, uh, S.L. Green, the developer in this particular case at One Vanderbilt, really did work hand-in-hand -hand with the administration and the council to try to achieve uh, goals that were good for all involved, and I certainly want to recognize them as well. And then finally, I want to congratulate all of the nominees today, uh, but especially to the, the Board of Health. Uh, as you'll recall, the last time we had votes for members of the Board of Health, I actually voted against members because of issues that we had where the Board of Health was creating rulemaking that uh, I believe then and believe now infringed on religious liberties in New York. And uh, I have uh, assurances from the new nominees based on uh, questioning yesterday in the Rules Committee under our ABLE Chair, Brad Lander, that these nominees will in fact uh, take into consideration religious and other cultural considerations before engaging in rulemaking that impacts minority groups in the city of New York, and I'm grateful for that, and therefore I'm proud to vote aye on their nominations and on all nominations as well, and all items on today's agenda, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you. Johnson. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, I just want to uh, echo Councilmember Drums, I think, very, very eloquent words about the nomination before us of Stanley Richards. Uh, this is extraordinarily important given Stanley's experience, given the work that the Fortune Society has done and continues to do in New York City, and all of the attention we've seen cast upon uh, the really difficult circumstances and violence at Rikers Island. Uh, we need someone who can put themselves in the shoes of the people that they're there to represent, and I know that Stanley is going to do that on behalf of people that may not have a voice and who have been marginalized 
uh, for too long. So I am very proud that the council uh, put forward his name. I want to thank the speaker for doing that. I want to thank Councilmember Drum for his advocacy. And I also want to say that Dr. Raju, Dr. Gill, and Karen Redliner are all outstanding nominees to the Board of Health. I proudly vote aye on all. Kalos, permission not to explain my vote. I vote aye. <laughs> King. <laughs> Thank you. Koo. Aye. Kozlowitz. Aye. Lanceman. Aye. Lander. Sorry, request permission to explain my vote. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. Boo. It's got to stop him from booing, Madam Public Advocate. Um, uh, I just briefly, in my capacity as chair of the Rules Committee, want to add my voice uh, to all the nominees that we heard yesterday. Certainly, uh, Stanley Richards was very moving in his, um, uh, the ways in which redemption and opportunity and the real moment of change uh, are facing us in the council. And so I want to thank uh, Councilmember Drum for putting that nomination forward and the speaker for, uh, for making it. Um, but I will also add that Dr. Ramanathan Raju, Rose, uh, Rose Gill, and Karen Redliner for the Board of Health were deeply thoughtful on issues of social determinants of health and things that our Board of Health needs to be doing to make sure inequalities in our city don't keep seeping into the health of our people and what they're going to do to try to make a difference there. Um, well, William Aguado is being nominated by the Bronx delegation to the Taxi and Limousine Commission, brings a deep understanding of Bronx communities, and Patricia Mocker, the Council's nominee to the Youth Board, uh, a real passion for small nonprofit organizations, something that this council knows is, is needed. So thanks to all who attended and are supporting them. Uh, congratulations to all my colleagues and especially to council members Gorodnik and Manchaka for finding ways to work through tough issues uh, and achieve really good resolutions for their community and for the future of the city. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Levin. Aye on all. Levine. Aye on all. Mizell. Yes. Matteo. <laughs> Menchaca. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I also want to extend my congratulations uh, to Mr. Stanley Richards. I know we had a quick conversation uh, before the stated, and I look forward to working with him and all the other nominations. I also want to say thank you to all the pieces, or all the members and the pieces of legislation today. Proud to be on all three of the transportation bills. But I want to focus a little bit on the land use item 224 uh, that you are all voting on right now concerning the maritime lease between EDC and SBS for that 72 acres of Southern South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in Sunset Park. Um, after months, and if you all remember, we began this in November of last year, we have been engaging with our city agencies, our community organizations, and local residents we are now at a place and we have a framework where we can more equitably balance the needs of our community with the needs of our city to activate this very, very important city asset uh, on the waterfront in our manufacturing districts. And so I am thankful to my colleagues and most especially to our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, for standing by my side every step of the way to advocate for this comprehensive community development uh, on this precious precious piece of property. Ramon, thank you so much. You were there every step of the way. The Land Use Division, Raju and Brian and Anne, thank you for your countless hours on this. Council members Peter Ku and Greenfield, thank you for the land use work. Um, and then also Dan Gorodnik, uh, Council Member Dan Gorodnik and his staff, uh, Genevieve especially, you've provided that kind of capacity that I think is shown so much uh, every time anyone goes to you, you, you brought, you bring your game, your A game, and you were with me every step of the way. I could, I could never say thank you enough. Uh, and all at the same time, you were bringing your own chapter to conclusion uh, on Vanderbilt, and so congratulations to you. Uh, finally, uh, in my final seconds, uh, Vladimir Martinez and Lee Wellington. Lee Wellington, uh, if I can quick, quickly finish, uh, is uh, going on maternity leave, and so this, she'll be transitioning out, uh, and so I wish her the best. She's been providing so much capacity uh, for me, and I thank her with all my heart, and welcome David Estrada, my new chief of staff. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Mendez. I vote aye on all. Miller. I don't know. Palma. Reynoso. Oh, aye. Richards. I don't know. Rodriguez. Aye. 
Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Yes. I vote aye and all. I just want to uh, give a particular shout out to Councilmember Menchaca for standing his ground and really um, looking out for his residents. You know, he has now set a precedent for the rest of us that in situations like this, um, when EDC comes in and is making a uh, change to someone's district, that now there's an opportunity to talk about a resident, a significant, important resident input. And Carlos worked in t tirelessly on that, and um, it's going to make a difference for all of us as EDC comes into our district. So I really want to congratulate him on that. I also want to congratulate Councilmember Levine for, um, and the speaker for uh, starting an office of civil, um, what am I thinking? Civil, like I'm justice blanking, I'm blanking justice. out. A civil justice coordinator. Um, you know, with the amount of evictions and harassment that our tenants have to deal with, this is going to be a sea change for them. So congratulations to you both and I and all. Thank you. Torres. I and all. Traeger. With congratulations to my colleagues, I vote I and all. Ulrich. I and all. Valone. Congratulations to my colleagues and especially Dan Garodnik. Your vision is helping the entire city. I on all. Weprin. Williams. Excuse me, I vote? Yes. Uh, thank you. I uh, also want to congratulate all of my uh, colleagues. Uh, I do want to say a particular congratulations to Carlos Menchaca, uh, who I think uh, took a lot of undue heat uh, during this process, but I believe has made this uh, institution stronger uh, for all of us, so thank you for that. And I did want to give a special shout of congratulations to Stanley Richards. Uh, again, I'm very proud that I'm um, part of a body that has done this, unfortunately for the first time, but definitely I hope not the last, and as I mentioned, during the hearing. Uh, too often we uh, put these programs together without talking to the affected people. We do that in youth programs a lot. We put together youth programs without talking to young people. And when it comes to criminal justice reforms, uh, we do not talk to the people who have been affected. So I'm proud that we have uh, done that here, not only spoken to them, but appointed them to the board. Uh, in addition of this whole discussion of uh, across the country of Black Lives Matter and police reforms, there are many institutions that we have to bring into that discussion, and I believe we're doing some of that here. Uh, I would like to abstain on LU number, um, land use numbers 2000, um, land use numbers 209 and 210, and I on all the rest. Wills. Aye. Ignizio. Yes. Van Bramer. Uh, permission to briefly explain my vote. Yes. I just want to congratulate all and want to say that I'm proud to represent uh, the Fortune Society, uh, that great institution called Long Island City Home. Uh, congratulations to Stanley Richards. And, and a point of personal privilege, uh, uh, I know the speaker is going to introduce a very special guest in the front of the room uh, in a moment, but in the balcony is another special guest, David Rothenberg. Uh, is standing up there because of Stanley Richards and the Fortune Society, but also uh, there are six openly gay and lesbian members of the City Council. Uh, I'm proud to be one of them. And in 1985, uh, David Rothenberg became the first openly gay man uh, to run for City Council in the City of New York. He's up there in the balcony now, and I just want to say thank you, David, uh, for everything you've done. And the six of us I know uh, uh, walk in uh, your shadow. So uh, thank you to David Rothenberg, and he's up in the uh, balcony right now. Continuing. Speaker Mark Viverito. Um, I'll be voting aye on all. I, I do want to thank uh, Chair Rory Lansman for his work in helping us shepherd uh, this Office of Civil Justice Coordinator. Very proud day for this council, and I vote aye on all.
Thank you. All items on today's general order calendar were adopted by a vote of 49 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of land use 209 and land use 210 with accompanying resolutions, which was adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, zero negative, and one abstention. Now to the speaker, Melissa Mockley-Rito, for a very special introduction. Yes, and an extension of my remarks, I'd like to um, ask all my colleagues. Uh, here we have with us today uh, the mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, Carmen Julín Cruz Soto, who is with us. Um, <laughs> who is visiting New York City this week with uh, some of her staff. She has Carmen Serrano, Maximo Colón, and Noelia Quintero here. Um, she's here to speak at the... Quiet in the chambers, can, please. Quiet in the chambers. If you give me a second, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. The mayor of San Juan is here to speak at the Ideas City Conference, which is being hosted by the New Museum, uh, and already to, and to continue to strengthen the ties that already exist, the deep ties that exist between New York and San Juan. Um, I first met the mayor when uh, she was actually running for office uh, against an incumbent and uh, wanted to learn about participatory budgeting, which is now being implemented in San Juan as well. So uh, what we're doing here it has had an impact abroad as well in other parts of, of this nation. Um, since then, I've had the privilege to speak at her inauguration. She's become a very good friend. Uh, she's bold and a visionary leader. And always a pleasure when we can visit each other in our respective cities and learn uh, about what is happening and figure out ways that we can continue that connection and that bond. So it's always very special for me to be back on my island in Puerto Rico where I was born and raised and spending time with someone who understands and cares so deeply about the island's largest city. Um, one of the things I'll say, it's really funny, she loves coming to New York and eating at Grace Papaya. Um, that is one of her first stops whenever she comes to New York City. Um, but Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico and New York will always have strong ties and when I speak on behalf of the council, uh, Madam Mayor, that we uh, are honored to have you here and would ask maybe if you wanted to say uh, a few words. Can we ask if, if colleagues could pay attention? We do have a dignitary visiting our city and it'd be nice if we could pay attention for a minute. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. Melissa Mark Viverito and Magnolia's Bakery. That's a must also. I am the granddaughter of a sugarcane plantation worker, a man that earned 50 cents a week for cutting sugarcane from when the sun came up till when it came down. So I am deeply honored and humbled to be before you today, especially in a city that means so much to us. I was telling Mayor de Blasio yesterday that he truly is the mayor of the largest place where Puerto Ricans live, which is New York. I am the second mayor. Every week, thousands of people come and go between San Juan and New York. And with each of them, thousands of dreams, thousands of hopes, but also the ability to adapt, to change, and to become part of something that is quite different. I was a member of the House of Representatives of Puerto Rico four years before becoming mayor of San Juan. And I know what it is to be discarded when people say a person is never going to get to where they think they're going to get. But summoning together all of those voices that people don't tend to listen to, but that are strong voices, the LGBT community, the women, the teachers, the unions, the students, those that society has left behind. We worked together a coalition and took office not to be in power, but to use power for the good of the people. So when I am in a place like this, I always remember that after all, I am just the granddaughter of a sugarcane plantation worker, that one day dare to hope there to teach somebody else how to read and write, and there to understand that we are nothing if we are not together. Because Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito was kind enough to show us in San Juan what participatory budgeting is, 
We are now doing that in San Juan, and we are being asked to go to Panama City to help them implement participatory budgeting there. And we have been asked to go to Chihuahua, Mexico, and talk about participatory budgeting and start them on the road to that. So you see something that started in New York City that touched the hearts of people in San Juan that has changed completely. The dialogue and conversation, not about being from one party or another, but about being people, looking for the betterment of people, has been able to touch other lives. So I thank Melissa Mark Viverito for her friendship, for being a beacon of understanding that things can be done a different way, that people are listening, and that when we truly work together, it is more than a mantra. We really can do things that will end up doing what women like Carmen Arroyo have done before us and women like Melissa and I hope to do someday. Thank you very much for this very honor that you bestow upon me today. And uh, Julene's ties to New York are even deeper since I married her here with her husband in my district. So um, the ties continue, and, and I really want to thank her for her leadership. We're going to be doing some wonderful work together. Um, and so it's great to have her here with us today. Uh, with that, Madam Public Advocate, back to you. Thank you. We are still in session. We welcome the Madam Mayor to the City of New York, and now we will turn to resolutions, beginning with Resolution 282, Introduction and Reading of Bills. Madam Speaker, Introduction and Reading of Bills. Yes, all bills are referred to committees as indicated on the agenda. And now resolutions, the first resolution beginning with 282 and 426, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, I rise today to, to ask my colleagues to uh, vote in the affirmative for these two resolutions, which would extend the um, Screegee benefits to homeowners and would also uh, end the sunset provision for raising the income level of $250,000 for Scree and um, DRE recipients. It's so important at this time more than ever that we uh, preserve the housing for our most vulnerable and these resolutions ask the state to do just that. I want to thank council members Cohen and Williams and um, uh, Chin for their support in shepherding these resolutions through and helping to look out for those who really need our city's safety net. Thank you. And now Resolution 410A, Council Member Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, ask my colleagues to uh, please vote on this uh, legislation, uh, which calls on the state to adopt legislation A627, sponsored by Assemblymember Brian Kavanaugh, which increases the income threshold eligibility for the disabled homeowners exemption, DHE. I'm very proud to work with my colleagues to pass this resolution. Uh, I'm going to also thank Council Member uh, Cohen for shepherding this through, as well as Chin and Rosenthal, uh, who are working on uh, similar issues. We know that millions of New Yorkers pay more than half of their income in rent, and expanding the uh, D eligibility would encourage Albany to act and ensure that more New Yorkers who have disabilities are protected against rent increases that would force them to make some terrible choices. Um, and I'm hoping uh, while we're talking with Scree and Dre, we've done some great things, although there's some issues now that we have to fix. We want to make sure that the uh, dis disabled homeowners exemption uh, also is held up to par. So uh, thanks to the Council on the Mental Health Committee, Kate Theobald, Matt Kowab, and Laura Popper, and uh, Nick Smith, and uh, Kimberly Williams. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers on any of the resolutions, we are now going to vote on Resolution 282A, a resolution calling upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign Senate 4748 and A, Assembly 5565A, legislation increasing the income threshold for the Senior Citizen Homeowners Exemption Program. All of those in favor say aye. All of those opposed, any abstentions? The ayes have it. 
Resolution 410A, a res resolution calling upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign S4748 and A5565A, legislation increasing the income threshold for the disabled homeowners exemption program. All of those in favor say aye. All of those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Resolution 426A, an amended resolution calling upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign S4748 and A5565A, legislation eliminating the sunset provisions related to income threshold increases for the senior citizen rent increase exemption and disability rent increase exemption programs. All of those in favor say aye. All of those opposed? Any abstention? The ayes have it. Resolution 453A, resolution calling upon the New York City Department of Education to affix Quiet in the chambers, we're still in session. Resolution calling upon the New York City Department of Education to officially recognize the importance and benefits of school diversity and to set it as a priority when making decisions regarding admissions policies and practices, creation of new schools, school rezoning, and other pertinent decisions, and commit to having a strategy in each district for overcoming impediments to school diversity. All of those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. And lastly, Resolution 572A, a resolution calling on, on the New York State Legislature to introduce and pass and then a governor to sign legislation which would provide a $100 tax credit to each taxpayer who adopts a dog or a cat from a shelter. And that was Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Johnson, are you in favor? Yeah. All of those in, in favor say aye. Any abstentions? And the ayes have it. General discussion, beginning with Council Member Cornegie. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Imagine you're a 75-year-old senior living in an apartment you love in Crown Heights or Washington Heights or Jamaica for the last 30 years. At each lease renewal, your rent has gone up, but your income hasn't. Not for a long time. The neighborhood is changing around you, and the check isn't <laughs> stretching to cover rent and your other bills every month. And then you learn about Scree. With the rent you're paying, your income, and your age, it looks like you qualify, so you pull together the paperwork and wait for the relief of the safety net provide, that the safety net provides to catch you. But instead, you get a complicated response from the Department of Finance saying the rent you're paying isn't your legal rent at all. It's a preferential rent, and the legal rent, according to your lease, is maybe $50, $500, or $1,000 higher. So the safety net you are praying for that this council has fought to improve for you does not exist. This is the state of the law today. Until our partners in Albany address preferential rents as a critical affordable housing issue, seniors and disabled New Yorkers in gentrifying neighborhoods will be, sub will be subject to huge, completely lawful increases when their leases come up for renewal. But today I'm introducing a bill to act as a stopgap measure. Intro 798 would empower tenants who are rejected for scree injury to research their legal rents as registered with DHCR instead of relying solely on their landlord's representation. This may be a number they've never focused on because it wasn't consequential to them. The Department of Finance would also be required to inform these vulnerable New Yorkers of their legal rights. For example, not to be harassed, to renew their leases and pass them on in a family, and to have all eviction proceedings go through court. I hope, you, I hope you'll join me in signing on to this measure to address a clear and present danger for low-income New Yorkers today. They wouldn't have applied for scree injury if they didn't need help. Let's give them all the help they need. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Williams? We're still in session. Quiet in the chambers. Uh, thank you. Uh, my colleagues, uh, this week, uh, this Memorial Day weekend, uh, we had some uh, terrible shootings across this city. Uh, this week compared to last week, I believe uh, the murders were up about 60%. Uh, but year to date, uh, it's too high, but still a little lower. I believe murders up about 15%, shootings up about 10%. Uh, obviously, this is not something that we can condone or ignore. And unfortunately, the vast majority of those shootings are black and Latino males on black and Latino males. I still believe that this is a crisis that we must address. And we cannot and should not address it with a police alone. While I believe that they are a critical partner here, they cannot be the only partner. I'm proud of this council and the mayor who expanded uh, several initiatives that we have. Uh, I hope that uh, some of that gets expanded more, uh, as well as uh, increasing the job opportunities for the young people in these communities. But most of all, I want to make sure that the 
conversation continues on how we address the problem of crime in these communities and dealing with the structural issues that are generational to these communities, not as an excuse for personal responsibility, but as an understanding that there are problems that we have to fix. Until we do that, the ebbs and flows uh, of the violence is going to continue, and we should not want to live in a city or a space where the only way we can feel safe is if there is a police officer in every corner. And I also thank the officers who risk their life uh, every day in dealing with some of these issues, and I hope we continue the conversation in a way that's productive and effective. I would also like to ask my colleagues to sign on to Resolution 711, uh, calling on the U.S. Congress to pass and the President to sign the Compassion Access, Access Research Expansion and Respect States Act. It would change the way the marijuana is viewed at a federal level. It would reclassify marijuana as a Schedule II drug. The government would open up the possibility of further scientific testing on the effects of marijuana on a range of ailments. Thank you. Councilmember Gorodnik. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to introduce a bill today. It is Intro 799, along with Councilmember Rosenthal, Chairs Ferreras and Cornegie of Finance and Small Business, and all of our Manhattan colleagues that would end the commercial rent tax on small and medium-sized businesses. As we all know, rents are rising very fast, not just residential rents. This includes rent on commercial space. Our favorite mom and pop stores are being squeezed out as rents rise astronomically high. Wherever we walk in this city, storefronts are quickly filling up with chain drug stores and banks. This is not the New York City we all know and love. Manhattan businesses south of 96th Street have to pay a tax on the rent that they owe. For small and medium sized businesses, this tax can be crippling. A small store paying $360,000 in rent per year owes $14,000 in taxes to New York City. That's half of an entire month's rent. We want to give them some relief and to eliminate that tax for businesses paying less than $500,000 per year on rent. And to ensure that the bill is revenue neutral, we have proposed balancing it with a very small increase on the largest corporations that pay over $3 million a year for rent. Mom and pop stores are getting squeezed out. They are the ones that are struggling most from the pressure that this rent tax is creating. I urge our colleagues to support this bill and to take some concrete steps to stand up for small businesses. Again, it is intro 799, and I encourage you to sign on. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I ask all of my colleagues to sign on to Resolution 706 that I'm proud to introduce this afternoon with my good friend and former and current colleague, Councilmember Espinal, which would ensure that all PA systems in our public schools are operational and installed in all of our classrooms and recognizing that PA systems play a valuable tool in communicating to our teachers, educators, and students throughout our city. And I also want to thank all of my colleagues for standing with us on the steps of City Hall just yesterday in our collective call in supporting school crossing guards in our city and recognizing that we have not enough school crossing guards, but we also want to annualize their health benefits, raise the hourly wage to $15 an hour, improve the recruitment and retention efforts, and raise the cap on their weekly hours from 25 to 30. I appreciate all of the work in working collectively with DC 37, Local 372, and many of our school crossing guards and recognizing they are the lifeblood of public safety in our communities that keep our children safe. I want to thank Councilmember Brad Lander for joining me and leading the press conference, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, and all of our colleagues for standing with us. Um, there is work ahead, and I thank you for your work in recognizing the value that school crossing guards play in our city. And I also want to thank all of my colleagues for reaching out. As Councilmember Williams described, it was unfortunately a horrific weekend for some. Um, in my community, we yesterday celebrated the seventh birthday of Lloyd Christopher Morgan, who unfortunately was gunned down in the midst of gun violence in Morrisania in my community three years ago when he was just four years old. Yesterday his killers were sentenced, but we also celebrated his birthday. So I ask you to keep his mother and father in your thoughts and prayers. And thank you again, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you. Councilmember Kalos. 
I rise today to introduce Introduction 800 with Councilmember Rosenthal that would limit synthetic pesticides in favor of biopesticides derived from natural materials. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, biopesticides tend to be less toxic, faster to degrade, and more targeted. Yet one of the most common herbicides used by the Parks Department is Roundup, a controversial, controversial synthetic pesticide that has been shown by the World Health Organization to be a health risk to children and create resistant weeds. I hope you will join me in supporting legislation that would limit synthetic pesticides like this one. I also want to thank first graders and kindergartners at Public School 290 and their teacher, Paula Rogovin, for advocating so strongly on this issue, and New Yorkers for Parks for their support. I hope you'll join us in signing on to Introduction 800. Councilmember Levine. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I want to call my colleagues' attention to Reso 709, which I'm pleased to be co-sponsoring with Speaker Mark Viverito, which calls on the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign H.R. 1013, also known as the Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol Act. Uh, colleagues, you know that the toll of prohibition on marijuana has been tremendous. It's led to the incarceration of hundreds of thousands of nonviolent offenders throughout the United States. It's a law which has been applied unequally in which people of color who do not consume marijuana more frequently than whites are far more likely to be arrested for it. That's true here in New York City as elsewhere in the country. And the prohibition has fed a vast international network of illegal drug traffickers. This for a drug which is less lethal and less addictive than alcohol or tobacco. And so the purpose of uh, the federal legislation is to begin to treat marijuana like alcohol. Uh, we see states around the country who are moving in this direction in a very patchwork, inconsistent way. We don't need 50 different federal drug administrations. We need one unified national law that would start to deal with this substance rationally and fairly, that would tax it to bring revenue, and would regulate it in a way that prevented consumption by minors while ending the terrible toll that prohibition has caused in this country. Again, this is intro 709. Thank you. Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I just want to talk briefly about the admission selection criteria for the specialized high school and then move on to talk about the situation in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, many of us like to wear various labels and talk about how we want to be seen in a certain light. But when the statistics show that of all the major cities, New York City is the only city that relies on one single high stakes test to determine whether or not a student is admitted to the specialized high school, I think we need to wonder whether or not we are in a group that is in fact addressing all of the criteria and the taking a position that allows multiple criteria to be used to determine whether or not students are admitted. New York City is the only school that, the only city that does not do that. Uh, the American Psychological Association, the American Education Resource Association, and the National Council of Education, of Measures of Education, all say that there should not be a single test that determines whether or not a student is admitted. 85% of the specialized students come from only 15% of the middle school. So we have a problem. We don't have a middle school education system that is in any equitable way sending students to that. And what's, allowing, what's happening is that students who have the means to take the prep courses are flooding the systems and black and Latino students, although they are 70%, although they're 85% of the, of the school system, 70% of the school system are only 11% of the population in the specialized high schools. And finally, I would call our attention to the ongoing matter of um, police misconduct. It's a national crisis. The latest incident that has been brought to our attention is the officer, one of several, who fired 137 shots at two people who were unarmed in their car. It's an issue that needs to be addressed, and my solution is not any additional police, but programs that come to the community and rely on community-based organizations to interact with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Espinal. 
Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I'd just like to talk again about Resolution 706, which I am introducing with my amazing colleague, Vanessa Gibson, and involves the PA systems in our schools. You know, they are a vital component and are used by principals and administrators to provide important safety and security information to both teachers and students during emergency or crisis. Recently in my district, there have been numerous lockdowns and there have been situations where teachers had to walk out of their classrooms to leave the students unattended, unlock their doors to notify other teachers of a gunman around, in or around the building. It is clear that having fully operational PA systems is a necessity to ensure the safety of our children and their teachers during their time in school. Parents need to know that the school their children attend is a safe environment for them. I'm not sure how endemic this problem is citywide or if it is just an issue happening in my district, but even the prospect of just one school not having a fully working PA system is alarming to me. So I urge all my colleagues to please sign on to Resolution 706. Thank you. Council Member Cumbo. Thank you. <clears throat> Stability and a high quality education are crucial to the intellectual and social development of our children. In communities across the city of New York, thousands of working families will be displaced if we allow the closure of several daycare centers. Early Learn daycare providers have cultivated long-standing roots, jobs for so many in the community, the trust and support of the community to meet the needs of the families served each and every day. The Administration for Children's Services must act swiftly to protect the seats of our youngest students who deserve a fair opportunity to learn and excel. I was very alarmed to hear about the RFP process, which did not include any transparency. We will not know who the panelists were. We will not understand how they were evaluated, and we will not understand the rating score that the winners were actually given. This is a situation where we don't understand the diversity of those very individuals that are making decisions on behalf of entire communities. As a result of this process, daycare providers that have been in existence for 10, 20, 30, and 40 years who have built institutions in our communities that house the cultural experiences of our communities will be entirely wiped out because of one proposal, in this case graded by three individuals whom we will never know. And so I join, I invite all of my members to join me on the steps of City Hall at 2 p.m. on Thursday to stand with our daycare providers, parents and children in urging the Administration for Children's Services to keep our daycare centers open. We have to invest in our young people at the earliest stages and to make sure that they have all of the resources, all of the accommodations and educational opportunities that children all across the city deserve. And I hope that my colleagues will join me in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mendez. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I want to remind my colleagues that on Tuesday night, we are holding the LGBT Pride event here in Chambers. So I want to invite everyone to come. I also want to encourage once again, uh, please read my letter. Please come and join us, me and the speaker, on, on follow us on Friday on 2nd Avenue, and we will also be holding a moment of silence for the two young men who lost their lives there. And also, there is a BLA caucus meeting after we finish our business here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member King. Just congratulations, everyone passed legislation today. Thank you. Council Member Lander. Uh, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. First, I want to actually uh, join with Councilmember Barron and uh, 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 indicate that I continue to support her resolution to change the specialized uh, high school assessment test. I think the things that she said about it and the things we heard in the latter half of that 10-hour hearing that Chair Drum convened uh, show the need to address for the, the need to address the issue of diversity in the specialized high schools. It was quite clear at that hearing that the, that is not a consensus position amongst members of the body, and our resolutions tend to express things where there's an overwhelming consensus. So I, you know, understand, and I think it makes sense not to be voting on it today. But personally, I continue to support that position uh, and hope that it will continue to be advocated and supported in Albany. Uh, perhaps from the sublime to the ridiculous, I want to call uh, my colleagues' note to Resolution 708 a resolution calling on the state legislature, in particular the assembly, to pass and the governor to sign uh, A5956 and S4327 legislation that would allow pet dogs in outdoor seating areas of food service establishments, not require but allow at the gate, a great bar on Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn that previously allowed dog lovers to have a drink in their outdoor patio 
and bring their dog along. The Board of Health, the State Board of Health, cracked down and stopped allowing dogs and dog owners to have a drink in peace outdoor on the patio of the gate, an establishment which doesn't even serve food, and this new state legislation, which has passed the Senate but not yet passed the Assembly, but is lead sponsored by Linda Rosenthal and I hope will pass soon and the governor will sign, would allow dog lovers and their dogs to reunite and sit outdoor on the patio at the gate and share a drink, uh, as well as make that option available to other food service establishments and bars in all of your districts. And if you share uh, that goal, please sign on as a co-sponsor of Resolution 708. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. We love Park Slope. Councilmember Greenfield to close. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I'm actually curious, uh, Councilmember Lander, whether the, the dogs who are having drinks, uh, is it based on dog years, being 21? How do they show their ID? I'm, I'm really fascinated. Uh, they have by, to get by the that. NYC ID available for our... There's no debate. <laughs> Councilmember Greenfield. <laughs> All right. I, I really just wanted to thank uh, 20 of my colleagues who joined us today for a school safety rally. 46 of my colleagues are co-sponsoring Intro 65 that would provide security for non-public schools and public schools. I want to thank our great public advocate for being our first citywide elected leader to support this legislation. I want to thank the controller, three out of the five borough presidents as well, and uh, want to also once again congratulate Margaret Chin. I want to congratulate uh, Lou Fiddler on his birthday on the new kidney. Interesting side note, uh, Lou Fiddler is getting his kidney from a uh, recipient. His name is Michael Tobin. He's a political consultant. He gave Lou Fiddler, uh, Lou Fiddler gave him his first job, and as you know, Lou always collects and he is collecting many years later, oh, many years later, I'm teasing, I want to, I want to wish, boo. I want to wish Michael Tobin Your time is up. a speedy recovery, <laughs> a speedy recovery, and thank him for his generosity in giving Lou a kidney and really a new lease on life. We love you, Michael. We love you, Lou. We wish you all a speedy, speedy recovery. And uh, Brad and I are going to go take our dogs out for some drinks now. And lastly, I'd like to invite my colleagues to sign on to intro number 801, a bill that requires residential landlords to provide accommodations and planning for elevator service outages, which I am co-sponsoring with council members Traeger and Rosenthal. My interest in, le in legislating this issue was sparked in part by litigation that my office has been involved with challenging a landlord who was using elevator outages as a way of forcing out rent-regulated tenants. Quite simply, landlords must be held responsible to have a plan in place in case of elevator outages and to make reasonable accommodations for those who cannot rely on stairs. I thank Council Members Traeger and Rosenthal for their partnership on this issue and look forward to working with them. And to close, we now hear from our speaker, thank Quiet in the Chambers. Thank Quiet you, Madam Chambers, Public Advocate. Speaker, Melissa Margarito. Two quick things in closing. Um, one, I want to personally congratulate uh, uh, Councilmember Minchaka for um, the land use deal and I apologize that it was an oversight that we did not include your comments during a speaker's time. It was definitely merited. So congratulations on that. Um, and then, yes. And lastly, um, those colleagues that were at the SOMOS conference this past November uh, and that actually did take the tour with me to El Caño Martín Peña, um, want to, on behalf of the mayor, to thank everyone for your support. She represents El Caño Martín Peña, and it is an issue that is very dear to her heart. And our support and advocacy stateside here in the mainland uh, is very important to that cause. So thank you all for, for being a part of that as well. Uh, and so uh, it's about 3.30, and uh, we're going to be adjourned. <laughs>